Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Friends, we gather here today to lay to rest Larry Fenton. We gather together as friends and as family to celebrate his life and to mourn his death. However, we do not mourn as those without hope, but as those who know the love of God in Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit. We Presbyterians, as part of the Church Universal, refer to this funeral or memorial service as a witness to the resurrection. Because even as we mourn the death of one we love, we are bold to claim that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ, not even death. And instead, we look forward to that day when, as Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. We do not minimize death, but neither do we allow it more power than it deserves, because the power of death has been broken by God in the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so hear these words from Scripture. When we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with Christ in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And these words of Jesus from John's Gospel, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. And finally, from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our sorrows, so that we can comfort others in their sorrow with the consolation we ourselves have received from God. Let us pray. O oh God, who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Show us now your grace, that as we face the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and of death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days here are ended, enable us to die as those who go forth to live, so that living or dying, our life may be in Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Thank you.
closer walk with me. Granted, Jesus is my plea. At this point, I would like to invite Larry's son, Greg Fenton, to come forward and share some memories. Well, good afternoon, uh, family and friends. Uh, thank you very much uh, for taking time to join us in celebrating the life and accomplishments of my father, Larry Fenton. A father, a husband, a son, a brother, a grandfather, an extended family member, and a friend to many. Dad has left quite a legacy for the time that he was able to spend with us. His life was tragically cut short by a disease that we seem to know a lot about, but unfortunately know far too little about preventing and curing. Dad's decline over the past couple of years was hard to watch and comprehend, but we take comfort in knowing that he did his best to fight the negative aspects of the disease while continuing to support and love his family and friends. We all know that Dad worked very hard throughout his life always putting his family's interests first, despite the many challenges he diligently worked through. Starting out in Lansing, we eventually moved out to the sleepy rural community of Grand Ledge. In retrospect, a great place for us to grow up. Thoroughly committed to Michigan and all it has to offer, Dad took us boating out on Lake Michigan and didn't even seem to mind when we quickly developed an aversion to waves and the ensuing seasickness that followed us everywhere. I have fond memories of the many harbors and towns along Lake Michigan that we got to see, including Holland, Ludington, Manistee, Harbor Springs, and of course, Mackinac Island. Dad found time after working hard all day to follow and participate in our interests including Little League Baseball, Tennis, Softball, and Music. I remember attending Michigan State football games when Duffy Doherty was a coach and many a Detroit Tiger baseball game. Dad also contributed to my lifetime love-hate relationship with a game of golf. <laughs> he certainly had a lot of pride in his children. Dad continued to work hard as his children first graduated from high school, enrolled in college, graduated, 
and moved on to pursue, the, pursue their own lives. Somewhere in the midst of all this, Dad developed a relationship with and eventually married Joan. He and Joan eventually moved into a historic farmhouse in Grand Ledge, where Dad spent many hours restoring the house to its historic roots, making it an attraction within the downtown area. Several years later, they moved up to their home in Harbor Springs, where they enjoyed visits by family and friends, as well as the pleasant spring, summer, and fall weather, while well, mostly pleasant. We last came together in 2016 for Dad's 75th birthday. December is not a great month for weather in Harbor Springs. You probably don't need me to tell you that. For the four days I was here, it snowed continuously in a blizzard. I have, no, I have not so fond memories of snow blowing the long and hilly driveway twice. <laughs> Among other reasons, this is probably why they eventually spent with winters together in Alabama, certainly closer to the good weather. Among Dad's many great qualities, Dad was always there. He was there when his children were married. He was there shortly after his grandchildren were born. He was there when he could be for when I had change of command ceremonies. He was there for college graduations. He was there when his grandchildren graduated from both high school and college. Even as dementia had a very detrimental impact on his travel and mobility, dad was always there. One of my son's Kevin's friends at Virginia Tech helped to move dad around the campus in the warm early summer heat. Dad would not have missed Kevin's graduation for anything. Even at Christmas, we could always count on Dad being there. Much like he was devoted to his community in Grand Ledge, Dad was clearly devoted to his community in Harbor Springs. Devout members of their church, Dad's construction work in the local area, or hosting friends and families at their house, Dad and Joan enjoyed many years with tremendous memories in Harbor Springs. Dad introduced Stephen and Kevin to snow skiing, giving them lessons that resulted in learning the basics in a scant one day on Nub's Knob. Family filled Dad and Joan's summers in Harbor Springs. When winter closed in, they would travel to family before finally heading south for a, a warm respite. It's always hard to say goodbye. Words are hard to come by. Condolences are conveyed and shared. So while we pause from our busy lives to say goodbye to Dad, to Larry, to Grandpa, to Grandpa Larry, to Pop-Pop, let's take an opportunity to celebrate a life that had a tremendously positive impact on all of us. All of us would very much have will very much enjoy hearing of your fond memories of Dad today. While unfortunately all too short, Dad's life was full of accomplishment, full of devotion, and full of love, always putting family first. Thank you, Dad, for helping all of us get to where we are today. We can only hope to live up to your example as well. Christine and I, Lisa and Doug, Jody and Bob, Julia, Mark, David, and Carolyn, and everybody else that took time out of their busy schedules on a beautiful summer day. Again, thank you very much for taking time to memorialize Larry Fenton today. Thank you, Greg. He had opinions and shared them freely. <laughs> he had food preferences and he kept them strongly. He wore his emotions openly. By the time I met Larry Fenton, he was completely himself. A man who had worked hard so that he could enjoy the freedom of at the top of a ridge overlooking Lake Michigan and could spoil the grandchildren with ice cream. He would smile a squinty smile 
and declare that there was only one way to do something, such as making spaghetti sauce with pepperoni, if the subjects turned to current events, he would listen to what you had to say and would reply, uh-huh, and, and then he would give you his view to settle the matter, at least until Joan weighed in. He loved northern Michigan, the Alabama Gulf Coast, his good friends, his kids, his grandkids, Joni, and Michigan State, in whatever order you choose. <laughs> it is a privilege to join with you today in celebrating our friend. My family owes a great deal to Larry Fenton, a great deal. And I'm struck by how many lives he has touched how many relationships have been made possible because of him. To take just one example, it's because he brought Joan up here that dozens and dozens of friendships formed and we are here today. And the remarkable kids that he raised, the three of whom he was so proud, are touching the lives of school children, hospital patients, and service men and women around the globe. It is a breathtaking thing to say about a man who pushed a button, this literal button, when he wanted to be bad to the bone, <laughs> but to tell the story of Larry's life is to testify to the hand of God. Larry was born in Lansing on December 16th, 1941, just nine days after Pearl Harbor. That eventful time would influence the family for generations. His father, Earl, joined the Navy when Larry was just an infant and served as an officer. Larry's mother, Phyllis, accompanied Earl to the West Coast, waiting for him to board a ship, but his orders were delayed. So for six months, young Larry lived with Earl's mother and father. Grandparents helped to raise him through his boyhood. Even after Phyllis returned from California and after Earl returned from the war. The Navy loomed large in Larry's life, as did the love and the help of extended family. He loved spending time on his grandparents' dairy farm. Earl's mother had had four children and then one more son when she was in her 40s, so Larry had a playmate, an uncle, who was his own age. And they really could eat Larry's grandmother was an excellent cook who made sure that everyone on the dairy farm was well fortified. That's where Larry developed his lifelong love of cookies. There was a pie or a cake at every meal, including breakfast. Years later, when he and Joan acquired his grandmother's claw-footed table, Larry would reminisce about those wonderful desserts and remind Joan that there should be a pie or a cake on the table. <laughs> After his sister Jean was born in 1947, the family moved to Portland, Michigan, a rural town 20 miles west of Lansing. Earl's college education had gotten him off the dairy farm and into work for the Department of Agriculture that took him all over the state best of all to northern Michigan. At Portland High School, Larry was known as one of the go-to guys. According to Gary Munson, a classmate from 1959, who remembers that Larry excelled in school just as his father had. He tutored kids who struggled and made friends easily with his calm demeanor. Gary says, 
I best recall our times on the football gridiron. Larry was our quarterback. He was very quick and could move, maneuver with precision, which was a must for a quarterback's success. Coach Gill's famous reverse pivot was an unusual maneuver for a small town football team, but it turned out to be a big winner. The reverse pivot required the quarterback to confuse the opposing team when the ball was snapped by pivoting in the opposite direction of the play and turning his back to opponents before handing the ball off to a running back. Because of Larry's deceptive ability, it was extremely difficult for the opposing team to see where the ball was. All three running backs would crisscross in front of Larry and he would hand the football to one of these running backs. Larry was a master at keeping the play secret. We went on to win almost every game throughout our four years of high school. As a friend, Gary writes, Larry became my pseudo coach when practicing the broad jump, today known as the long jump, the practice pit was right next to Larry's house, and I was often practicing the jump after others had gone home. Larry would come out of his house to help me on my running approach and measurements after each jump. I recall many laughing moments and inspirational comments shared during those times. Inspirational comments. I think we can imagine some of the things that Larry said. <laughs> Having grown up all his life around Lansing with green and white corpuscles in his veins, it was only natural that he would attend Michigan State for his bachelor's in business administration. Right out of school, he worked as a loan officer at Michigan National Bank and married Shirley Gilmore of Holt. Together they had three kids in five years, Greg, Lisa, and Jody. He served as comptroller for Lansing Community College. And then one day, out of the blue, his wife just left. A talented musician, she had met a man through a music company and they headed off to Florida for a career in entertainment, leaving behind Larry's three young children. Larry was suddenly a single dad in an era when dads never had custody. It couldn't have come at a worse time for him. Yet he made up his mind to raise them as best he could. Times were tough. Realizing that he could make better money in construction, he partnered with a man who made partitions and their business was going really well until a terrible error led to the business's collapse and they lost everything. By then, Earl, Larry's father, had risen in line at the Department of Agriculture in Washington. He was just fourth from the secretary's spot. Larry drove the kids to DC to spend some time with his folks. Earl took them to what was then called Dulles Airport to watch the planes land and take off. And that's where Greg was exposed to flight. And that's when Earl and Phyllis decided to return a kindness that had been done to them. And just as family had stepped in to help raise Larry, so now they helped to raise Larry's kids. Phyllis became like a mom. Earl retired early at 58. He left that promising slot in Washington to take the grandchildren camping and fishing and Larry's sister Jean became like an older sister. All of them together provided stability 
while Larry worked hard to make ends meet. It was years before he had a job that provided anything near enough for them. And while he gave them his best, he expected excellence from them. Jody says, Dad had high expectations of us. We didn't know that alternatives to high performance were even an option. If they played in a band concert, the girls were expected to look sharp. If they took up a sport, the kids were expected to play to win. Jody, for example, was good enough to make the varsity tennis team as a freshman, and she loved to play against her father. They were both very competitive. Larry would come home from a long day's physical labor. Jody had been practicing long after her tennis team's sessions were done. And she asked if he would like to play, and tired as he was, bone tired as he was, he would play with her until she beat him one day. (laughs) And then he didn't play with her again. (laughs) At last, Larry went to work for a man named Hamill, building Hamill Homes, huge homes all over Michigan, as far north as the Leelanau Peninsula. It was hard work that took him away for days at a time. Some nights the kids had to manage on their own. Some nights he joined them for a pizza or takeout Chinese and watched a movie with them before falling asleep. God had better things in store. Psalm 127 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guard keeps watch in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go to bed late, eating the bread of anxious toil, for the Lord gives sleep to his beloved. Children are indeed a heritage from the Lord, The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has a quiver full of them. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Larry Fenton didn't know it yet, but God was going to build his house. And after years of hardship and disappointment, God was going to furnish him with a love story.
When Greg Fenton was a senior at Grand Ledge High School, he met with a blue and gold officer and committed to joining the Naval Academy. So too did a boy from Okemos named David Peterson. And so it was that Joan Peterson hosted a backyard barbecue for recruits from the Lansing area. Larry and Greg came. His calmness struck her. Her family was all high energy. Her husband, Harry, was high energy. And Joan just marveled at Larry's utter calmness. The parents struck up a friendship. Once the school year began, he traveled with Joan and Harry to Annapolis to see their boys. They wound up making a couple of trips together. What Larry didn't know then, or didn't know fully, was that Joan had been biding her time to get out of a troubled marriage. One day, Harry called Larry and said, I don't know what I've done, but Joan has left, and I need you to help me get her back. Larry worked at trying to convince Joan to rethink leaving. And against her better judgment, she did give it a try, went back, stayed four months, and then left for good, went to school and got certified to be a principal and a special ed director. For Joan, as it had been for Larry years before, this was a time of tremendous grief and loneliness. What saved her was getting together with friends, teacher friends who liked to play bridge. She needed the company and a chance to cook for them. Larry, of course, was a phenomenal bridge player, a very competitive bridge player, and their platonic friendship continued to grow, even as Larry maintained a friendship with Harry, too. In April of 1988, Joan's divorce became final. Her kids were up in the Northeast at that point, she accepted a job in Port Elizabeth, New Jersey to be special ed director and principal in an impoverished district about to be taken over by the state of New Jersey. It looked like it was going to be a hard job, but great experience. Larry said, you're going to leave? She said, yes, she wanted to be a principal and there were no openings to speak of in Michigan, he said, I don't think you've ever been to Mackinac Island, have you? I have condos up there that I've built, part of a hotel chain. Let's go up there before you leave. So the week before her daughter's wedding, they went up there, they drove to St. Ignace, Larry flew her by plane from St. Ignace to the island where a horse carriage arrived to take her to a fantastic resort. They watched as the sun set over the bridge and as the lights came on the bridge, Larry popped a bottle of Asti. He didn't miss a beat. The only thing that he couldn't have planned was the weather, and it really should have been dismal in the spring, but it was glorious. And that was the end of their platonic friendship. <laughs> they began a long-distance love affair. He flew to see her in New Jersey. She flew to see him in Michigan at Christmas. He proposed in February. She said yes. And after less than a year in New Jersey, she came back to Michigan because she loved him. She took a teaching job in Mason, fifth grade, which she hated, math, which she wasn't good at, <laughs> just to be near him. And then lo and behold, a better job appeared in Grand Ledge right where he was. In a service led by their good friend, 
the Reverend Lynn Grimes, they married on July 9th, 1989 at the Michigan State Chapel, of course. On their honeymoon in Hawaii, they read James Missioner's Hawaii together, the first of many, many books that they shared. And with the help of God, they began making a home together. Sometimes they made a home quite literally, rehabbing that 1875 house into a Victorian showstopper with 13 kinds of wallpaper on the dining room ceiling. And after a stint managing two tennis clubs, Larry itched to get back into home construction. He started his own business, building large additions and homes from scratch, and fulfilled his lifelong love of Northern Michigan by moving the business to Harbor Springs. At the top of a ridge, he built a home for Joan and named it Hilltop. You had to be part mountain goat to survive the harrowing rides up and down the driveway. It's a wonder that Larry didn't put his truck into the pond, but the views in my best Joan Fenton voice, oh, Larry. <laughs> Larry always said that he had come to Harbor Springs for the beautiful scenery, but what he loved even more were the people. He and Joan became very involved, first in the Methodist Church and then here at First Presbyterian. Later on, they also came to love the people of Gulf Shores, Alabama, and loved St. Andrew by the Sea so much that Larry made a personal mission of bringing my family to that church. I had the great privilege of serving as his pastor up here and down there. Over the years, this hardworking man became a softy. He spoiled his grandson, Josh, with a stuffed animal at Disney World. He took Brittany and Emma to Pond Hill Farm and Thorn Swift Swamp. <laughs> he was the grandpa to Joan's grandkids, Pop Pop to the East Coast kids, Grandpa Larry to Stuart and Chloe, and his disposition was perfect. He rolled with the punches. David's daughter Kayla says, I think my best memories with Pop Pop involved ice cream. All the times we'd arrive in harbor and on the first night we'd head to Kilwins for the first summer's ice cream. I loved his sense of humor. The time he called me a silly goose, and, or the time I called him a silly goose and he looked at me and squinted his eyes and said, well, you're a duck. And I cried so hard, but we laugh about that all the time now. And Hannah says that she got her sweet tooth from him. The word among all the grandkids was, don't tell Joan. <laughs> Joan thought when he headed out in the morning that he was just getting a newspaper downtown, but he was really stopping at Johann's Bakery and getting a breakfast before the breakfast that she had made for him. As fiercely as he loved family, he also fiercely loved Michigan State. He, he gave Brittany, who was then a junior at the University of Michigan, Spartan pajamas for Christmas <laughs> at a family reunion Bob was attending for the very first time. It was the first time he had ever seen Larry. Larry was ladling gravy into the University of Michigan hat belonging to Brad. It was, uh, it was lying on the table. That was Bob's introduction to Larry. And for the last recent years, Brad took an awful lot of abuse from Larry about how Michigan State had supremacy over Michigan in men's football and basketball and hockey, the three main sports. Brad 
did some research. He looked for some area where Michigan had success against the Spartans and found it in girls' softball <laughs> and called Joan with this news. He could hear in the background Larry saying, no one cares about girls' softball. <laughs> Brad says, if the maize and blue lose this fall on October 20th, I will just have to say a prayer to Jesus and have Jesus go tell Larry that he loves girls softball players as much as football players. <laughs> but you know, Larry was proud of all his kids and grandkids. He made every one of Hannah's performances with the Young Americans last year. And on a day when his son made the newspapers, Larry would elaborate to friends, let me tell you about my daughters. He and Joan enjoyed a love story. Together they read 153 books. They would read them by the fireplace in the winter. She would read them aloud to him on drives down south. 29 books by David Grisham, 30 by David Baldacci, 19 by Alexander McCall Smith, and four by Herman Woke, their all-time favorite, whose most famous books were set in the Pacific, the Navy, of World War II. Their love story persisted through the challenges of Parkinson's and Lewy body syndrome. Bit by bit, they found that they were also part of an even larger love story. The love of family came to mean more and more. The love of friends came to mean more and more. And the love of God, which had brought them together, really sustained them when they needed God the most. There's a word in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. He writes, if the earthly tent in which we live is destroyed, we have a home from God, a house not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. And we long for this home. Larry has found it. And for that, we give great thanks today. It's in that light that we might hear Psalm 127 too. It has a different resonance when we celebrate how one has gone home to be with the Lord. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guard keeps watch in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go to bed late eating the bread of anxious toil, for the Lord gives sleep to his beloved. Sleep to his beloved. Sleep to his beloved. Children are indeed a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has a quiver full of them. Thanks be to God. Amen.
we prepare to read from Scripture, would you please join me in a prayer? Eternal God, your love for us is everlasting. You alone can turn the shadow of death into the brightness of the morning light. Help us to turn to you with believing hearts. In the stillness of this hour, speak to us of eternal things, so that, he, so that hearing the promises in Scripture, we may have hope and be lifted above our distress into the peace of your presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. When I was speaking with Joan about uh, the service today and about scripture passages, she chose this passage from the book of Philippians, a letter that Paul wrote to a, a church he had founded there. And it's a passage uh, from the fourth chapter, reading from the fourth through the ninth verses, where Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have known Larry Fenton for a far shorter time than most of you. I met Larry about three years ago when I came up here to Harbor Springs. When I uh, met Larry, uh, soon after coming up here, Joan and Larry had invited us out to their house, uh, that house that you have heard about. Uh, and I was struck by Larry's pride in that place, honestly more by Joan's pride in that place. Uh, but the thing that, that really struck me was, was Larry's pride about the driveway. Yeah. That big, long driveway. Uh, and the fact that he cleared it. Uh, and he drove it. <laughs> that path from the house he lived in to the, the world beyond, right? he took great pride in that. When I first met Larry, he uh, had already started to decline. Right? That path that he had cleared for so many years was becoming harder and harder to clear. And after just uh, three years of knowing him, okay, he is now gone. It's difficult when we leave, lose somebody that we have known as, as husband, as, as father, as grandfather, as friend. And so we read these words from Philippians and it's kind of jarring. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. And we want to respond, really, Paul? Really? Do you not know what it's like to lose someone who means so much to you? How do we rejoice in the midst of the loss of someone who has, has been so significant in our lives? But Paul already tells us the answer from the beginning because he says rejoice in the Lord. Okay. Larry knew, uh, knew the Lord. Okay. Yeah. Larry and Joan were, uh, well, if you, if you were in town, you were here on Sunday morning. Okay. And they would, they would always greet me on the way out. Joan would reach over and give me a kiss. Larry, not so much. Um, yeah. And as the time went on, he became 
slower and slower on the way out the door. And the last time he went out the door, then they headed down to Arizona. And it will be some time before we see him again. And it seems hard to rejoice, except that we know the impact he has had on so many. And we know the faith that he had. I think about that path that he cleared and how, how proud he was of that, that ability to, to get from the house he lived in to the street that would take him elsewhere. And then I think about this disease that he had and how hard that must have been. I know it was hard on me who, who knew him just a little bit and can begin only to imagine how hard it was for those who have known and loved him for years to see the body decay, the tremors set in, the memory fade. And those words of Paul ringing in the background, they say rejoice, and we say, how do we do that? How is it we might be tempted to ask that a, that a good and loving God let something like this happen to someone we care about? And yet, we know that our good and loving God has expressed his love through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who calls himself the way, that driveway, that path that we are so proud of clearing, he says, you can't continue to clear it. We can't continue to try and make a way for ourselves to be reconciled and brought back into the presence of our God. And sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Often when I, when I meet with parishioners who are uh, struggling with you know, being in the hospital to get a new knee or dealing with a back that no longer works or, or a loved one whose mind is fading. And I encourage them to think, even though I can't, su- can't really support this with chapter and verse, but I, I have to wonder if God lets our bodies go, lets our minds fade if we don't get weaker and weaker so that in the end, when Jesus comes back and we get those resurrection bodies, we don't take them for granted. He wants us to appreciate them. But even more so, sometimes we need that reminder that we don't do it on our own. No matter how strong and how able and how talented we may be, that the path to God is cleared by Jesus Christ. And we need to be able to let go of that reliance on ourselves in order to trust him. I ran across a a poem um, just this morning as I was doing my devotions and praying about today and reading through a a book of poetry by an author named George MacDonald, a Scottish uh, poet and pastor who... uh, wrote during the 19th uh, century, and he, he wrote this. He said, well may this body poorer, feebler grow. It is undressing for its last sweet bed. But why should the soul which death shall never know authority and power and memory shed? It is that love with absolute faith would wed. God takes the inmost garments off his child, to have him in his arms, naked and undefiled. Those challenges we face strip us of those those inmost garments. We shed those things that, that we try to rely on, but that get in the way of our relationship with our God. And sometimes that is necessary so that so that our faith and God's love for us might might wed, might be joined.
We're called to, to rejoice always, right? even in the face of death. But we're also reminded that it is okay to weep. Our Lord Jesus, he wept at the death of his friend. He sat at Lazarus' tomb and wept. Even though he knew he was going to raise him from the dead in just a very short while. We can rejoice as we weep. And so as we weep for the loss of this man we loved, we also rejoice because we know that even now, he is in the arms of a loving father. He is in God's arms without those in most garments. He is naked. He is, he is truly himself and undefiled in God's arms right now. And so rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it one more time. Rejoice. For Larry is where Larry should be. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please pray with me? O God of grace, you have given us new and living hope in Jesus Christ. We thank you that by dying, Christ destroyed the power of death, and by rising from the grave, opened the way to eternal life. Help us to know that because he lives, we shall live also, and that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come shall be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so with the confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray that prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And let us continue in prayer. You only are immortal, O God, creator and maker of all. We are mortal, formed from the earth, and to earth shall we return. This you ordained when you created us, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust. Yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with all your saints, where there is neither pain nor sorrow nor sighing, but life everlasting. And so into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Larry. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. And as we prepare to go from this place, the family invites you to join them in the gathering place, which is off to your right as you leave the sanctuary, and to join them for, for refreshments, both of of body and of spirit as we share stories, share tears, and, and share laughter. Yeah. And let us go with God's blessing. Yeah. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, remain with you always. Amen. Amen.